Okay, so we're now going to take a deviation into uh, statistical thermodynamics. And this is going to give us some of the background that we need to understand uh, solutions, which will be in the forthcoming lectures. So you may remember at the beginning, we talked about macro and micro states. So macro, these are the macroscopic observables that you look around the room, for example, and you can see the you know, temperature, pressure, uh, number of moles, volume, these macroscopic properties. The microstate is the number or the, uh, the arrangement of molecules in the air or the arrangement of atoms that will give the macrostate. Because the molecular arrangements to yield Mac may see RO observables. So those. And what we're going to be talking about today is how we count these and how counting the microstates will give us information about possible uh, macrostates, the enthalpy and the entropy. So imagine a, a system and, you know, say we know the energy of the system is known. And let's say that the system is made up of molecules or atoms, and those atoms can take up certain energy levels. Uh, e sub i, and these energy levels can be, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I didn't draw these very even, but imagine uh, I had a graph paper and I drew these evenly. And let's say there were a, a total of three particles or three atoms energy is known, and uh, three, three molecules. And we'll say these are, they're, these are even. Call you some separation delta. And those three particles are all sitting at that state. So E tote is equal to three, not EI, three E one is equal to three delta. And that's going to be the total energy. But another way that we could represent these, whoops, uh, another way that we could have the same macroscopic energy is to have one particle at zero, one at one, and one at two. So now we have E tote is E zero plus E one plus E two is equal to three delta. So two microstates the same macroscopic energy. So let's talk about the ways that we can count these now. Well, I'm gonna, we could have 
and we'll keep these zero, one, two, three. We could have, you know what, maybe I'll just run these across the page. EI, well, we could have all three at one, or we could have three, zero, zero, or zero, three, zero, or zero, zero, three. Or we could have let's pick a blue zero two one or zero uh, one two or one zero two or one two zero or two zero one or two one zero so we've got six of those three of those and one of those <clears throat> but these all have the same macro state and if we're counting any one of those we can use oh, we can use omega is equal to n factorial over and zero factorial and one factorial dot 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 and r factorial and that is n factorial over the product i is equal to one two r n r sorry n i up n i factorial so let's let's uh let's take an example let's take an example of uh, let's take an example of three of uh, the case where we have three zero zero so we have three zero zero then n is equal to three and zero is equal to two, and one is equal to zero, and two is equal to zero, and three is equal to one. Which means omega is equal to three factorial over two factorial, zero factorial, zero factorial, one factorial is equal to three times two times one over two times one times one times one times one is equal to three. And that is what we observe. So if we can specify the occupancy of a set of states, of a set of microstates, then we can count the number of microstates that we can possibly have. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, uh, why is zero factorial equal to one? Well, that's because we can express uh, we can express factorials in a recursive manner, right? So, for example, we know. We know that uh, 
n plus 1 factorial is n factorial times n plus 1, right? That's the definition, right? Because it's we're just adding one more to that factorial. And that means that we can write n factorial is n plus 1 factorial over n plus 1. So for example, if we had uh, 3 factorial, that would be 4 factorial over 4, which is 24 over 4, which is 6. 2 factorial is 3 factorial over 3, which is 6 divided by 3, which is 2. 1 factorial is 2 factorial over 2, which is 2 over 2 is equal to 1. And Zero factorial is one factorial over one, which is one. So this, oops, this is why zero factorial is one and why we can use it here. Okay, so we have uh, a means now of counting the number of subsets of microstates if we know how we're describing that particular microstate. Now the question is, becomes which distribution of these microstates is going to be the most populous. And in this case, you know, it's six because it's a small number, but as we start going to larger numbers, we have to start asking, okay, so what, what distribution is going to give us the largest? And you can probably see that this is heading us toward uh, the concept of, of entropy. Which Which one has the largest omega? Yep, and we're going to do that. We're going to determine this through. Oh, come on. Oops, there it is. We're going to determine that through the use of the Stirling approximation. And that Stirling approximation is that if you have some natural log of a number, you're taking the factorial of it, this is approximately x times the natural log of x minus x. So let's see where that comes from. The Stirling approximation comes from if we have some natural log of x factorial, that's the natural log of 1 times 2 times 3 times dot, 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 times n, or sorry, n, x, and that's going to be equal to the sum j is equal to 1 to x natural log of j. Now, if you have a summation like this, and say you're adding up 
blocks, one, two, da, 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 two, x. If you have a large number of these, so basically you're taking and you're taking a bunch of little grids and you're adding them up, then your summation approaches an integral. or a large x, which means that we can replace this with the integral from 1 to x natural log day, j dj. And that will give us x natural log of x minus x plus 1. And that's because natural log of 1 is equal to 0, right? So we got rid of the, uh, the natural... Oops, oh. That means that... Uh, we got rid of that natural log term. And now uh, this term the large values of x, I should say this term here boom, boom, is approximately x natural log x minus x, right? Because this left-hand side is going to be much larger than 1. For example, uh, if x is equal to 100, then the error from the Stirling approximation is around 0.3%. If x is... 1,000, then the error is around 0.02%. And the truth of the matter is, in statistical thermodynamics, we're not talking about tens or hundreds. We're talking about x is on the, on the order of Avogadro's number, right? 6 times 10 to the 23. So the error is around zero. So the Stirling approximation is going to be valid. So let's see how we apply this. So we had our expression for counting we had our expression for uh, counting, and that is uh, right here. That's our expression for counting. So let's take that omega is equal to n factorial over the product in I factorial. Using N, I can't remember, I, yeah, Ni. And now we're going to take the uh, natural log of this. So we get the natural log of omega is equal to the natural log of n factorial product n i factorial, which is the natural log of n factorial minus the natural log of the product of n i factorial. And the natural log of a product is the sum of the natural log. 
So this is, natural log of n factorial minus the sum of the natural log of n i. So we can now apply Stirling's approximation. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. We're taking the, the log of the factorial. Uh, so now applying Stirling's approximation, we have n natural log n minus n minus the sum, and i is equal to you know, zero to r, ni natural log ni minus ni. Okay, that's uh, natural log omega. So let's uh, just mark that and we'll come back to it. Now, we need to apply some constraints that we know. One constraint we know is that uh, energy is constant. So the energy sum i equals zero to r and i e i. And the second is we know that you know, mass is conserved, right? So the number of particles is sum i equals zero r and I. And C U N S is constants. Now, what that means is that any change we make of the system, and we can take these particles, right, and we can move these particles around any way we want. So, you know, we can go from here to here to here to here, and we can have these particles moving around in their energy states. But any time that they move from one microstate to the next, the macrostate has to be maintained, meaning that the variation in the energy due to the variation in the number of particles cannot change, it's constant. And the variation in the total number of particles, which is the variation in the uh, number of particles in each state, also cannot vary. So this variance can't change. So what this means is that if we have the variance of something that looks like this, well, we take this and we treat it like a derivative. So we have dn natural log n, whoops, sorry, plus n, and the variance in the natural log n minus n. Well, that is variance in n, natural log n, plus n, 1 over n, dn minus dn, right? Remember, 
the derivative with respect x is 1 over x, right? So this, well, crazy screen. Uh, this is what happens here, right? Well, we've got these. So this is 1. So this entire sum is 0. So this is equal to del n natural log n. So applying what we have here to our uh, natural log of omega, we have variance in the natural log of omega is Okay, that is variance in n natural log n minus n minus the sum of the variance of n i natural log n i minus n i. So we know what the right-hand side of this equation looks like now. This is going to be uh, this is going to be del n natural log n minus the sum dni natural log ni, but we know dni is equal to zero, right? That's one of our constraints. So that means that the d natural log omega is equal to minus sum i equals 1 to r d n i natural log n i. Now, what does it mean to maximize? Omega. Well, what it means is that what it means is that if we vary omega, it's at an extrema. Which means it's equal to zero. The variance. is equal to zero by definition. So let's mark this equation. This is something we're going to come back to. Now let's go back to our constraints and figure out how we can address these. Now, uh, we're going to apply we're going to apply Lagrange multipliers. And this was something probably from third semester calculus that you had a couple of terrible homework problems on, and uh, you made it through the exam and then moved on. Uh, well, then actually an application. And if you go back to your... Uh, third semester calc book, you'll see something that has kind of this form,
Well, in this case, your Lagrange multiplier is your little Greek letter. In this case, it's a lambda. And this is your constraint. So you're solving your equation, imposing this constraint, and the Lagrange multiplier is what's going to be imposing that constraint. In our case, we have the constraints that the variance of u Uh, epsilon i the variance in ni is equal to zero and the variance in the number of particles sum i d ni is equal to zero so we're going to introduce the lagrange multipliers sum beta epsilon i d n i equals zero and some alpha variance in n i is equal to zero and these are our Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so we got those. Now let's go back and uh, substitute these into our equation. And how do we do that? Well, we have uh, this equation, which uh, sums to zero. We have this equation, which sums to zero. And we have this equation, which sums to zero. And because we know that zero plus zero plus zero is zero, we can write, we can write that sum del ni, natural log ni plus sum D N I alpha plus sum delta N I epsilon I beta is equal to zero. And collecting on those terms, we get the sum over I, the natural log of N I plus alpha plus beta epsilon i d n i is equal to zero. Well, this d n i, we're not able to control that, right? We're saying that our universe, which is made up of these microstates, we're constantly moving between them. Right, and we can't control that. Which means that in order for this entire expression to be equal to zero, that must be equal to zero for all possible values of i. So regardless of the configuration, we know it has to be equal to zero. And this is where these Lagrange multipliers come in handy, right? Because what we have is natural log ni plus alpha plus beta epsilon i equals zero. And we can take and arrange that to give us ni is equal to e to the minus alpha e to the minus beta epsilon i. And if we take the summation of this,
then we get the summation of ni from i is equal to, you know, 1 to r. Maybe we're doing 0 to r. I can't remember what our sum is, but we're summing over, over all possible states. I think we use 0 in our picture. Uh, is equal to n. The total number of particles is equal to e to the minus alpha sum i to r e to the minus beta ei. And this summation is called our partition function. And there's different ways to represent it. Most physics books use a capital Z, so I'm going to do that here. And because we have the partition function, well, in principle, we know all of these energies, right? It's something that uh, if we have some type of you know molecular dynamics or some way of counting the vibrational states or energy states that a molecule can take, we can determine what this energy structure looks like. Maybe you've got some density functional theory type people and they're calculating those for you. So you know what the partition function looks like. And that means that we can write e to the minus alpha is equal to n over z. And because we have e to the minus alpha, we can put whoop, crazy pen again. We can put that up into this expression, which means that the number of particles in a particular energy level have to go as n over z e to the minus beta epsilon i. And that's very, very useful. Now, I'm, I'm going to say here, and it bothers me because right, right now I, I don't have the, uh, the proof with me, uh, but I know that this comes from the, uh, the laws of thermodynamics that beta goes as 1 over the temperature. And in fact, beta is 1 over Boltzmann constant times the temperature, where K Boltzmann is uh, 1 point. 38054 times 10 to the minus 23rd joule per Kelvin, or K Boltzmann is equal to the gas constant divided by the Avogadro number. 8.3144 divided by uh, 6.02 times 10 to the uh, 23. So this will give you uh, which is something you've probably seen before. So what are the implications of this? Well, the implications are that If you have the energy and the number of, I'm not calling them particles, as I'm calling them molecules, aren't I? So let's call them number of molecules with a particular energy. Our curve will have a shape that looks something like 
this. So say this is energy level, say, huh, epsilon three, then this is the number of molecules with energy level three. If this is epsilon five, then this is the number of molecules with epsilon five. So N five is less than N three. It's one thing. The other is that as we increase the temperature, beta goes down, right? So this uh, should point out this and I right here. Well, and I we have that. And that Z, that partition coefficient, oh, that's going to be constant, right? Because it's a sum. But what's going to vary is this term. So as we increase temperature, decreasing beta, we see a shift in the shape of this curve like this. So as we increase the temperature, then the, then the number of particles at energy E5 is now close N5 prime, right? it increases. So N5 prime is larger than N5. And at the same time, we talk, talk about these lower energies. Say, say this is a, say, epsilon two. Well, if that's N2, and that's, N2 prime, then we're shifting it so that the number of lower energy states decrease. So we're shifting this curve to have more molecules or particles at higher energy levels as the temperature increases. So this is basically saying that we're increasing at energy per particle on average as we increase the temperature. So what are we interested in? Well, what we're really interested in is we're interested in what is the most probable distribution of particles. And, and this is something we're interested in because we're interested in knowing what the world around us is going to look like, what the most probable set of microstates are. What? What is the maximum uh, structure? And what we find is that as the number of particles increases, total number approaches the max number. And by that, I mean, think about something really simple, like think about flipping coins and you say, okay, yeah, how many ways can I flip 
you know, three coins and get all heads up, all heads down, or maybe four coins, how many ways can I get a 50-50 combination? And, you know, you may have some distribution that looks like that. As you increase the number of coins that you're flipping, that's going to become something that looks like And ultimately, once you get up to an Avogadro number of coins, it becomes a you know, quasi-continuous distribution, and it's going to look something like this. So the maximum number, or the state with the maximum number of possible configurations is really the total because the, the area under this curve is going to dwarf the area under this small, minuscule, flat area. So that means that our omega, which we've been working with, is the total and is also the maximum. or large n, which we're always working with. OK, so let's go back to uh, where we started and substitute in this value for n sub i into, keep going backwards here, substitute that back into this expression for the natural log omega. And doing that, Doing that, we come up with, we come up with natural log omega is equal to n natural log n minus the sum n over z exp minus e sub i over kt natural log n over z exp minus e sub i over kt And then we expand this natural log. And expanding that natural log, we get n natural log n minus n over z. We can take that out of the sum, right? Because there's no, uh, this is a subscript i. We're not summing over anything. over the sum exp of minus epsilon i over kt times the natural log of n minus the natural log of z minus epsilon i over kt. And uh, let me put a square bracket here. Okay. Now we can also take these outside of the sum. Oops. To give us is equal to n natural log n minus n over 
z natural log n minus natural log z sum exp minus e i over k t plus n over z k t sum epsilon i exp of minus epsilon i over kt. Okay, so we've got that. Now, this term is z, right? That's just our partition function, which means this side of the equation is n natural log n minus n over z natural log n times z minus z natural log z Oops. sorry times n over by n over z times z natural log z. So these cancel out. So n natural log n minus n natural log n is zero. And this term will cancel. You get n natural log z. Now, this term, this term is going to require us to take a, a step back and uh, think about u, the energy, which is the sum ni epsilon i, which is the sum epsilon i n e to the minus epsilon i over kt over z, right? That's our substituting in for ni, which is n over z sum epsilon i e minus epsilon i over kt, which these two look a lot alike, right? You go, ah, crazy uh, screen again. That and that, and n over z and n over z. So this is this which means that this term on the right-hand side sum epsilon i exp minus epsilon i over kt is equal to u z over n. Which means, going back up to our term here, remember this is natural log omega, which is the total and the max. We have the natural log omega is equal to, is equal to uh, Sorry, n natural log of z plus u over kt. Okay, so we're going the right direction, right? At this point, we've got the total number of 
microstates of the dominant macrostate related to the energy. So let's picture a system in which we can have an exchange of energy. So say we've got a system And we're going to put that system in contact with a large heat bath. At constant temperature. And we allow the system in the heat bath to exchange heat. So we have fluctuations in the heat, but no work, right? So we're not going to allow work to be done. Okay, well, that means that the total energy of this picture is the energy in the system plus the energy in the bath. And the total volume is the volume of the system plus the volume of the bath. And the number of particles is the number of particles or number of molecules in the system plus the number of particles in the bath. And if we say that these are constant, the energy, the volume, and the number of particles Then the variation in, sorry, the variation in the natural log of the number of states which comes from there is the variation in the energy times kT. Right? Remember, these are constant, so our energy is, is not, our, our uh, number of particles is not fluctuating. So, and we're also not allowing the exchange of work. And no, uh, no uh, mass exchange. So we're left with this. But that also means that du is dq. So the, vari the variation in the energy is the variation in the heat. So that means, and you can probably see where this is going now, natural log omega, del dq, kt, and we have that del s is del q, over T, which this gives us del S is equal to K del natural log omega and these are both state functions so we don't have to think about the path or exactly how these change, which means S is equal to K natural log omega. This is the Boltzmann
equation. And that is going to be very useful going forward. So I'm going to uh, break this lecture into two parts, and this is going to be where we stop for the first, and we will have a continuation into the second part following.